sound. Okay, excellent. The reason that we don't trust you is that if you need a transcript, we'd be very happy to provide. Very those. good. Well, I will need that. I'm sure. We're going to bring Ken Tomlinson okay. down with him, sir, the head of VOA, who is uh, now at the Reader's Digest at Pleasantville. You had him on uh, Remember Ken? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then our editor in chief thought that. Uh, might be more effective just one-on-one, -on -one. Uh, so Ken right. Ken deferred to me. I remember an interview once I had there at your. Have you ever seen their headquarters? No, I haven't. Well, it's a kind of a beautiful country home, out spacious lawns and it so forth. It is indeed. <laughs> and the president uh, absolutely captivated Dewitt Wallace, our founder, for about four and a half hours, and uh, <laughs> then you finally had to leave to go make a, a speech. But it was a memorable lunch. What? we would like to do here, sir, is to uh, ask you some questions so that our readers here and abroad, about a hundred million of them, can have a better idea of President Reagan the man. And uh, I'd like to start off by asking uh, what has surprised you the most, pleasantly and unpleasantly, about being inside the government that you've had for so long observed from the outside? Well, first of all, I guess one surprise, whether pleasant or unpleasant, was at um, how little I was surprised. <laughs> because um, uh, the eight years as governor of California, I realized when I came in here, suddenly it wasn't a great shock as becoming governor had been. But the discovery of the, of the kind of the routine, the scheduling, the, uh, all of that, and while there was added the international situation, uh, I, uh, the, the rest was, uh, as I say, not too, not too shocking. There was, however, uh, there was a surprise having to do with being the commander in chief and uh, things of that kind. One part of it that shocked me a little bit was the first time, only weeks after we were here, the Jack Kilpatrick invited us down to a Sunday lunch this house and the helicopter picked us up here in the lawn and very shortly we landed there at his farm and, and uh, he told me that uh, they'd been there for several days installing the phones and I said what do you mean installing the phones and that was when I found out that I can't even go across town to a lunch or a private dinner without phones are installed and it was explained to me uh, well, Jack explained it that, as they had explained it to him, that uh, wherever I was, uh, I had to have the ability to communicate to any place in the world. And in telling him this, they told him that they could reach anyone for me, and he challenged them on that. And they said, name someone. Now, Jack is telling me all hmm. this. And he named a son of his who was on embassy guard in a country in Africa. And uh, they got him on the phone, and he and his wife got to talk to their son. So um, they asked him, wasn't anyone else? And he said he had another son who was a quartermaster on the USS Pratt, a destroyer out in the uh, Sixth Fleet, the Mediterranean. And when he said, well, can you get him? And they said, no. Well, he said, you said you could get anyone. Well, they said, no, the fleet is on maneuvers. And the only one who can get the fleet when it's on maneuvers is the president. So. Jack was telling me all this, and we got there, and we got in the house. Uh, I met the young man's wife, a very sweet young lady. Hadn't seen her husband for months. And I excused myself, went back out, and I said, is this right that I could get someone in the USS Pratt in the Sixth Fleet? And they said, oh, yes, sir. And I said, well, get Quartermaster Kilpatrick. And I went back in and got her. Well, she got to talk to her husband, whom she hadn't seen, as I say, for all those months. And I didn't realize what I'd done. It was a surprise to find out that uh, what just a few words from me, <laughs> I have to think a little better because I got a letter from Quartermaster Kilpatrick. And he told me that I would be surprised what air traffic was like. I hadn't even thought it through that the last portion of that call would be by radio. And um, he said that, um, <laughs> He'd, uh, that the air was admirals talking to admirals and ships talking to ships constantly, all of this. And then a voice on the air said, White House calling. 
And another voice said, what code is that? And another voice said, maybe it's no code, maybe it's the White House. And he said, even Hollywood could not have silenced the air as quickly as it was silenced. Then he said, they came down and got a lowly quartermaster on a destroyer to come to the phone. And he wrote this line, which I'll never forget. He said, it was as if God had called the Vatican and asked for an altar boy by name. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> making, making that call was obviously not the toughest decision you've had to make. Uh, what has been the toughest decision in the four and a half years? Well, there are a lot of the tough decisions, the ones in which there's so much right on both sides. I make the cabinet uh, go over and over these things in front of me there, and I hear because when there's differences of opinion because of the split between right and wrong. And uh, when I've heard enough, I. I make the decision. I've, I've always used the cabinet, as I did as governor, as a kind of a board of directors, except for one thing. They don't vote. Uh, I have to make the decision. But I think the hardest ones will always be those instances where you have to, or you order our young men in uniform to go someplace where their lives will be endangered. That is without doubt the most difficult. When you became president, uh, you didn't have any foreign policy experience. Uh, has your view of the world changed in the four and a half years? Well, I have to tell you that the, the premise is a little wrong. Not that I had been a diplomat in any way, except that, again, having been governor of California, uh, while it didn't have a foreign policy, uh, if California uh, we're a nation, it would be the seventh ranking economic power in the world. So you had some interest in, uh, and it is, I guess, uh, the biggest percentage of, of trade in and out uh, of our country is by way of California. But it wasn't that. I had always had an interest in international affairs, uh, particularly because of the Soviet Union, and when I was president of the Screen Actors Guild, the effort of the communists to move in on the motion picture industry. And all I can tell you is that when I was running for governor, uh, some of the press editorialized that if I didn't stop talking about international affairs, I'd never become mm -hmm. governor. And, uh, but I did have that interest. And then, as governor, four times the president asked me to do some missions and mm -hmm. errands for him abroad uh, that took me to 18 different countries in the world, and some of them uh, uh, several times, more than once. And um, so that has always been an interest of mine, and there wasn't much that had to be changed in, in my opinion about uh, the good guys and the bad guys and. Uh, and what our responsibility was. Did it, did it bother you uh, that when you came into office, uh, some or maybe even many European intellectuals or elitists uh, viewed you as an actor, cowboy, uh, with simplistic views about the world uh, scene? And if it did bother you, uh, do you think that uh, view has been altered in, during your term? Well, it didn't really bother me so much because I had gone through that same thing uh, <laughs> being governor. There were some people that thought to go straight from uh, the acting profession to governor without having uh, held any other political offices uh, was as you've described it. Um, no, it didn't bother me so much. I do think there has been uh, a change now that we've become personally acquainted. Uh, when I say we, I mean uh, heads of state of a number of our allies. Uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, we were all on a very cordial first name basis in, say, the economic summit. And uh, uh, no, I don't think that prevails now. When, what books and what thinkers most influenced you before coming to the White House? Now that's... That's a tough question, because I have been a voracious reader, uh, whether it's of books, nonfiction, uh, as, as well as fiction, but uh, that and uh, 
articles, publications, and so forth. Uh, I, I to try and pick out someone in particular, I, I just don't think I can. I've I've uh, opened myself up to just about all the viewpoints there are in that sense. And as I say, I my my greatest dread, my nightmare is that sometime I might be caught in a hotel room someplace with nothing to read because I don't think I could go to sleep or shut mm. my eyes if I didn't read myself to sleep at night. You mentioned uh, before, just in passing, and I'd like to get back to it, uh, your role as president of the uh, Screen Actors Guild. Uh, I've read that uh, that uh, period in your life, uh, perhaps uh, more than any other, shaped your attitudes and your policies. Uh, what did your experiences as a labor leader teach you? Well, I was very proud of the Screen Actors Guild at that time. Uh, when I went into the job, I found that it had, it existed on some very firm principles. For one thing, the Screen Actors Guild uh, said there, the Guild will not be engaged in politics, nor will there be politics in the Guild. We believe that our members uh, were of every kind of philosophy, and therefore there was no way that by even a majority vote we had a right to take a position politically that might be counter to the views of, of our members. We also, uh, and for two decades, I was in charge most of the time of our negotiations of the uh, reinstitution of the basic contract mm -hmm. with the producers. And I discovered, I didn't institute it, I discovered it was already there. The Screen Actors Guild had its own rule, which was, good qualities it could be. And we stuck to those things. And I had the pleasure, after some of those years of negotiating, to have the head of one of the studios, who was always very prominent in their negotiating committee, tell me one day that when the Guild was first proposed, the idea of an Actors Guild, he was one who fought the hardest against it. But he said, I've come to believe that the Screen Actors Guild is the most constructive force for good in the motion picture industry. But uh, Could you describe uh, briefly the fight with the communists over control of the Screen Actors Guild? Yes. And incidentally, I was a New Deal Democrat, fresh out of the, out of the war, out of the uniform. We got out and uh, there had been the Ava Vell CIO had, had pledged, you know, no strikes. And yet, of the 43 guilds and unions in the motion picture business, most of us were Ava Vell CIO unions. And this strike was a jurisdictional strike. It was called over whether some 350 people in the whole picture industry should be members of a stagehands union or members of the, uh, the trade unions. We had that mix. And back from the days of a great strike on Broadway, in the theater days, there had been a tradition in the picture business to reconcile the differences between stagehands. What had happened in the theaters in the old days was that a stagehand did everything in the theater, not just backstage with the stage. So that if a seat needed fixing out in front, he came out like a carpenter mm -hmm. and fixed the seat. And this had led to the jurisdictional strike on Broadway. And the settlement finally was that everything behind the proscenium arch belonged to the stake hands. Everything in front of it belonged to the craft unions, plumbers, electricians, and carpenters, and so forth. In Hollywood, they made the proscenium arch the soundstage door. Anything in there was stage hands. But every studio had mills where they made, in sections, the sets. And you'd see at the end of the day the sets for the next day's shooting being wheeled down on rollers, down the studio streets, huge sections like the whole wall of this room here, and all of it, and into the soundstage. In the soundstage then, the stagehand union set erectors put these pieces together. That was, they were then behind the proscenium arch. The issue that they picked for this jurisdictional strike was that the set erectors should be carpenters. Now carpenters worked in the mill and made those 
sections. These fellows only put them together. This led to the jurisdictional strike. The, uh, the then czar of the, of the Carpenters Union had always had a rivalry with the stagehands, mm -hmm. so that was the cause of it. During the war, there had come subversion and, and infiltration of some of the unions, even some of the Amphibile CIO unions. They had formed a rump group called the Hollywood uh, Conference of Studio Unions. In, and this was in contrast to the AFL CIO Labor Council. So they were on one side, we were on the other. Now, I was not prepared. I wasn't a red baiter. As I say, I was a New Deal Democrat, and I, I had never gone for all of the stories. Uh, I'd been told after I got back by some that there had been this kind of infiltration into the picture business. I wasn't prepared to believe it. I am the one who made the motion on the board of the guild. I was a board member at the time, not president. I made the motion that as long as there was this difficulty, this, that both sides giving a different reason as to why there was a strike, why didn't we, the actors, who weren't involved in any way in that jurisdictional thing, why didn't we invite management and both factions to sit down at a table with us present as a labor union to uh, kind of be the mediator there and, and to protect against a management who had nothing to do with the strike, um, to sit down and find out because we had to tell our members whether to go through those picket lines or not. And uh, how do you take sides when a lot of the unions are in the studios and a lot of them are out on the street picketing? And uh, the, the board bought this idea and we invited them. There was great reluctance on the part of the striking unions to join us, but they didn't see any way that they could mm -hmm. say no. We met twice a day, as it ended up, for almost seven months uh, trying to settle these things, but before long, there was no question about it, and I was completely converted when I found out that, uh, yes, this was not a legitimate strike. And uh, I learned it even better when we made that decision and called a mass meeting of the Screen Actors for the Hollywood Legion Fight Stadium, and, and uh, it was voted that I was going to report the result of these meetings to the membership and give them the board's recommendation that we continue to go through the picket lines and honor our contract mm -hmm. with the studios. And that was to be on a Wednesday night. And on a Monday afternoon, I was on location in a picture we were making down at the beach. And I was called to the phone at an oil station some distance away. They came and got me, drove me down there. And I was told on the phone that if I made that report to the guild membership, there was a squad that would see that I never worked in pictures again. And so uh, I made the report uh, to the guild. And uh, there were pickets outside the guild meeting and so forth. And I had a, about a three quarters of a block walk to the parking lot where my car was parked afterward. And I felt very comfortable when I found that, oh, about eight of the Teamsters Union, all about the size of pro football players, decided that they'd just walk to the car with me. <laughs> and uh, before that, by the time I got back to the studio that day after that call, I've never heard of this in the law enforcement before, but the Burbank police in which the studio was located, they had representatives there at the studio, and um, the special police, which were the guards of the studio, were assigned to my house for 24 hours a day, round the clock, and uh, they also gave me a permit and uh, hung a revolver under my arm and a shoulder holster. So um, 
that was the beginning. And I guess you didn't want the whole load on this strike, but it did go on for a number of months till finally uh, there was no giving in at all. Uh, we kept the studios open with the help of the unions in and the management, and as long as we were in front of the cameras, there wasn't any way they could stop making pictures. And finally, uh, it just was a case of which uh, we said to the people who are out on strike, you can get back <coughs> into the studios the best way you know how. But in some of those meetings with them, the strike committee, because they weren't all communists, I actually sat and heard studio executives, I mean union executives of some of the unions, speaking to the, their chairman and saying, look, we know the communists have got control of this strike and we've got to get it back in our hands. They were legitimately fooled. They didn't realize. And that was the history of it. And it was in that that I learned something that kind of set the stage for me as governor and later on here. I, during all those months, you know, there couldn't be help but be times in which I said to myself, who am I uh, to be making these decisions for thousands of actors and actresses whose careers are at stake? And I found out that they wouldn't, what I recommended they would do. And then I finally decided the only way I could sleep at night was to make up my mind that if I did what I honestly believed in my heart was right, I, I may make a mistake, but if I could honestly believe that that was the right thing to do, that's what we'd do. And when I became governor, I told the cabinet that on any issue that would confront us, I did not want to hear any of the political ramifications of the issue. I only wanted to hear what was right or wrong for the people. And we'd make the decision on that basis, not on any political basis. And uh, I found I do sleep very well. If I can ask you <clears throat> one more Hollywood uh, question. Uh, as an actor, you played uh, many, many roles. Is there any one role you would like to have played but never got an opportunity to? Oh, there. <laughs> Uh, I have to tell you, there were, there were many such. Um, once you're in that business and doing it, you, um, you see a picture and you think, oh boy, oh, if I'd have, and you find out the things you said that you would do different and so forth. But yes, there was one. Being under contract to Warner Brothers, in a picture called Santa Fe Trail, in which I played the second lead, I was not a star then, um, to Errol Flynn, and uh, we, it was an historical uh, picture, and he played Jeb Stewart, and I played uh, George Custer, and all the others were there, and we were uh, just graduated from West Point and into the cavalry, and this was really the story of the capture of John Brown, and uh, played that, and I always loved those. I didn't, these people that say cowboy actor, Good Lord, my biggest fight with Warner Brothers after I was there 13 years was they wouldn't let me do pictures <laughs> like that. I was doing the drawing room comedies and so forth. And uh, then they made, uh, they died with their boots on, the story of George Custer. Well, having played him once, oh boy, I wanted to play that part. And I went to Hal Wallace and I begged and so forth. And I said, but I've played Custer once already. And that part's mine now. But uh, Errol Flynn played George Custer. I didn't get to. Commentators and some former presidents have talked of the loneliness of the presidency and the burdens of the presidency, yet you seem to approach the job with great relish. Uh, do you find it lonely or burdensome? Uh, how would you describe it? No, I don't. Uh, I surrounded myself with people that I have confidence in, that I believe in. I. I don't think that I sit here all alone and decide everything by myself. I, as I say, I, I want to hear everybody's viewpoint. And uh, I don't give any indication of where I lean while I hear those viewpoints. And I've had people in our cabinet who were cabinet officers under other presidents tell me that they had never been in cabinet meetings that were as fruitful before. Evidently, the, a lot of presidents just simply 
used their cabinet as a kind of a, well, they'd meet periodically and uh, different members would report what their departments were doing. They, the word that I've gotten from these others is that they never found or were in cabinet meetings where everybody, regardless of whether it affected their particular agency, were involved in the discussion. But no, I, and maybe again, it was the, uh, the eight years experience. I have to believe for, for many years recently, we've taken our presidents from the ranks of the legislators. I think the best training, the closest job to being president in the United States is being a governor. A legislator is used to being in a group and on a committee and making decisions on a voting basis, majority rule. Uh, only a governor has sat there and when finally knows that the final say has got to be his or hers. And uh, so maybe that's, I attribute part of this uh, to that. I don't say it's easy. There are a lot of decisions that uh, after I've heard all of that, and as I say, the ones that, where there's so much right on both sides that are very difficult. But um, no, I don't, I don't have that, that feeling. Every, every day you receive detailed intelligence briefings on the entire world. What information that you've received most shocked or worried you? The, well, of course, the, the greatest shock was a telephone call on a weekend at about three o'clock in the morning when a couple of us or a few of us were down Regan and George Schultz and, I and our wives were down at Augusta Country Club. I'd never been there before. We'd gone down for a, at George Schultz's invitation for a weekend of golf. And it was the word about the bombing of the Marines in Lebanon. And that, uh, there's no way to describe the horror and the grief to, as the word came in about that. And um, in this other, my great concern stems from that same thing, the increased use of terrorism, which we have to believe is backed by some governments. It's so hard to, to fight because unless you could infiltrate and know in advance uh, what is being planned, there's no way to know where they're going to strike next. Uh, you could retaliate with just outright revenge if you didn't care how much terrorism you caused. But until you know where the, and who those individuals are and where they could be reached, I've never believed that we have a right to just simply go into an area of people who might be of the same general background and slaughter some of them in revenge. So it's, it's one of the most frustrating and one of the causing the greatest concern because you know that you can't abandon your positions in the world. You can't withdraw uh, ambassadors and diplomatic staff and so forth are the terrorists of one, and you can't let them do that. But you know that all those people out there are at risk every minute. If I can <clears throat> ask you for your reactions to two other moments of crisis in, crisis in your administration. Uh, what was your feeling when you decided finally to send American troops to Grenada, to Grenada? Well, this again, you knew that the final say has got to be his or hers. And um, so maybe that's, uh, I attribute part of this uh, to that. I don't say it's easy. There are a lot of decisions mm -hmm. that uh, after I've heard all of that, and as I say, the ones that, where there's so much right on both sides that are very difficult. But um, no, I don't, I don't have that, that feeling. Every, every day you receive detailed intelligence briefings on the entire world. What information that you've received most shocked or worried you? The, well, of course, the, the greatest shock was a telephone call 
on a weekend, it's about three o'clock in the morning when a couple of us or a few of us were Don Regan and George Schultz and our wives were down at Augusta Country Club. I'd never been there before. We'd gone down for a, at George Schultz's invitation for a weekend of golf. And it was the word about the bombing of the Marines in Lebanon. And that, uh, there's no way to describe the horror and the grief to, as the word came in about that. And um, in this other, my great concern stems from that same thing, the increased use of terrorism, which we have to believe is backed by some governments. It's so hard to, to fight because unless you could infiltrate and know in advance uh, what is being planned, there's no way to know where they're going to strike next. Uh, you could retaliate with just outright revenge if you didn't care how much terrorism you caused. But until you know where the, and who those individuals are and where they could be reached, uh, I've never believed that we have a right to just simply go into an area of people who might be of the same general background and slaughter some of them in revenge. So it's, it's one of the most frustrating and one of the causing the greatest concern because you know that you can't abandon your positions in the world. You can't withdraw uh, ambassadors and diplomatic staff and so forth or the terrorists of one. And you can't let them do that. But you know that all those people out there are at risk every minute. If I can <clears throat> ask you for your reactions to two other moments of crisis and crisis in your administration. Uh, what was your feeling when you decided finally to send American troops to Grenada, to Grenada? Well, this again, you knew that there was going to be a hazard and there was going to, you were endangering their lives. But this again, on that same weekend, as the blow up in uh, Beirut, of all things, this also awoke us. Uh, before dawn with a phone call. And it seems that the several small island states, uh, those that had been uh, or in the Commonwealth of, of the United Kingdom, they had this word of what was going on in Grenada. And they felt that it was of such importance that action had to be taken. They were all in a union together with Grenada. But they knew that they didn't, you know, some of them don't even have an army. They knew that they didn't have the military strength to do it. And they made an outright request to us. I didn't feel that there was any way that we could, in the face of the evidence that they presented to, that we could turn down that request and ever be trusted or believed uh, any place in the mm -hmm. free world. So sitting there in those before dawn hours on the phone and with George Bush at this end and the emergency group assembled, uh, we, we made the decision uh, that we were going to do what they'd asked. We were going to join. It was an international thing, although we provided the bulk of the, the force. Uh, when the chiefs of staff were entrusted with putting the mission to be together, I made only one suggestion. I said, when you decide how many you think it'll take, then double it. And uh, this one we managed to keep a complete secret. And it, uh, it worked. There were some deaths. But uh, I've never been so proud of anything in my life as I was of those young men in uniform in the four branches of the service that were involved. And even more so when about 400, see what our stake was, I left this out, I shouldn't have left this out. This was a great consideration of ours. We had 800 young medical students, Americans, on that island. And the thought of another hostage situation with 800 young Americans, there was no way 
that we could tolerate that. And so that was the big deciding factor in addition to the other thing that I, I said. Then when I, about 400 of them came here to say thanks to the South mm -hmm. Lawn, and we had about 40 of the returned servicemen by that time back from the four, about 10 each from the four services. And to see these young people, and they were all young people, the people in uniform and the medical students, those medical students couldn't keep their hands off of them. And they'd come back to me and they'd say, I never really thought much about the people in uniform before. I wasn't, in other words, they were kind of that rebellious type, but not anymore. They said they saved our lives. And I heard a story of some who in their dormitory had been under the beds for 24 hours, and the bullets coming through the building. And then they said from downstairs, they heard a voice. And it was an American sergeant, a ranger, and identified himself and called out for them to come down. And they told, these were the students telling me, they said he was there and the Marines, or the Rangers, to take them to the helicopters. And they told us that when they went to the helicopters, those young men in uniform put themselves between the students and where any fire would come from, from the hills, from the opposition, and literally shielded them with their own bodies and getting them to the helicopters. And so uh, I had a great pride when it was over, but uh, it, uh, it, made you, it made me realize what other presidents who've had to ask for a declaration of war and so forth, what, what it meant. One other reaction question. Uh, what was your reaction when you heard about KAL Flight 007 being oh. shot down, and how did you hear about it? Ah, uh, I'm trying to think now where I was. You know, I can't remember exactly where I was, but the, uh, and as you'll remember, there was some, you know, it had disappeared from the radar screen, so there was still some question uh, before final verification of what had actually happened to it and that it was gone and the people were dead. And then, of course, it was shock, even though um, I, I thought that it was, it verified what I've believed about the lack of respect for human life that is felt by those in charge of the Soviet Union. And it was following that that I made a statement about an evil empire. I wanted to ask you, you did call the Soviet Union the evil empire. You've seen the Soviets shoot down 007 and murder an American uh, major. At other times, you've suggested that you and uh, Mr. Gorbachev can work together to achieve peace. Are those contradictory positions? No, not at all. Uh, I thought in the beginning of this administration when questions were asked of me in press conferences and so forth about the Soviet Union. I spoke bluntly about uh, what I felt that I knew about them and the fact that they are expansionist, they are aggressive, they, uh, they, uh, they have never withdrawn or retracted the Lenin statement that their mission is a one-world communist state. But at the same time, we have to live in the world together and I have to, I believe that the only way there will be World War III is if the Soviet Union wants a war. If they want peace, there will be peace because no one else wants a war. We certainly don't. I've never known of a war in my lifetime that we started. And uh, so I think that uh, it is, it is necessary that we face each other. Uh, we know they don't like our system or us, and we don't like their system. But uh, we have to see if we can't get a along in the world. And as I say, uh, they're the only ones that can cause a war. Do you expect to be meeting with Mr. Gorbachev? Well, I'm hopeful that uh, that will come about. Uh, we've had expressions that, uh, yes, they're willing. The ball's in their court. We've invited them, and it's our turn to, <laughs> to invite. 
and uh, we're ready when they are. But it's, uh, it's necessary for them to know that we don't have any illusions about them. But at the same time, we're willing to exist in the world with them. And uh, it's time that we sat down and found out uh, where the parameters are. You noted the other day that the Soviets have spent uh, $500 million to prop up a Marxist regime in Nicaragua, but the House has refused to commit even $14 million yeah. uh, to help freedom fighters. Uh, why have you not been able to convince the people that the cause of the Contras and aiding the Contras is the right cause? I think part of it is the sophisticated disinformation campaign apparatus that the communist bloc has worldwide to where they've been able to confuse a great many of our, our people. Even the terms we use, and I wish we hadn't, I wish we'd started doing something I'm going to do from here on. If we had referred not to the Sandinistas, but to the communists, not to the Contras, but as to the freedom fighters, that these are, these are Nicaraguans fighting for freedom in their own country against a communist takeover. When you say those terms, polls have revealed that a lot of our people out there, you know, uh, most people are not fully aware of the countries in Central America, or who they are, what they are, and so forth. And hearing these terms, Sandinista government, the Contras, and so forth, most people aren't quite sure which side we're on or what, what's at stake. And after Vietnam, there is a holdover of the Vietnam syndrome. There is a feeling, well, is this the United States sticking its nose in something none of our business? Yet when you ask them in polls questions about, do you want another Cuba on the mainland of the Americas here, uh, a communist, then the people will say, no, they don't want that. So I think part of it is the disinformation and we haven't been able to overcome it, but also our lack of outright explanation to them. We found after I made that one speech on Nicaragua, on the air, there was a great turnaround, but that was one speech. The disinformation kept on and on, and just like advertising uh, <laughs> constantly, it, it wore it away and it gradually it went back again to the people. Uh, thinking, oh, uh, maybe we're doing the wrong thing in Nicaragua. What's the significance of... Last question. Pardon me? Last question. Well... Uh, Two questions. Make them good, all right? Okay, I'll make them good. And, Mr. President, if we could do what we did when we interviewed, interviewed you in, in 81, because there's still some more questions, if I can leave them with Pat, and if he can get to you in the next uh, couple oh, of days to yes, uh, fine. do those, that would be... Uh, be very happy to. Do, uh, fine. Let me see. Uh, Being a reader of Reader's Digest. Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, your first accomplishment in 1981 was to push through a huge tax cut. Now you're fighting for uh, revamping of the entire tax code. When did you first start thinking about what you call the disgraceful inequities of the tax system? Well, I've always believed in those, or always, well, for a lot of years. I think it has gotten so out of line, so complicated. I've thought, I've thought that a, most of our people's, or many of our people's um, disgust with the tax system wasn't based on the, the size of the tax, but on the complication, the confusion of it. And uh, in 81, we, had, we were faced with the emergency, we felt, of the recession then and what had to be done, so we couldn't think reform. But if you remember in talking about our first tax program many times, we said this is only the first stage. Uh, this isn't the end. We want to come back. And what we wanted to come back with was a reform that could make it more fair, more simple. And uh, so that's been in our minds from the very beginning. Okay, one last question, and then I will leave the extra questions with, uh, with Pat. Uh, it's been four years uh, since you were shot. Uh, how has that attempt on your life changed your life, the way you look at things? <laughs> well, I don't know whether it's changed my life or not. I always was a, a pretty good boy about minding the security people when they told me to, 
<laughs> not to go there and not to go there. It has changed their life physically in, in a number of ways. Well, now that coupled with the whole terrorist thing, it wasn't just that. With the whole terrorist thing, uh, there are things that I can't do anymore, and I recognize it. For example, we can't go to church, and I miss that. But I recognize, it's not just me, I, I now, uh, I am a threat uh, to other people. If I go to some place like that with the various terrorist practices, car bombs and everything else, I could be responsible for the lives of a lot of other people. So I'm reconciled to that. The, the whole thing of that shooting, though, uh, you know, I went all the way to the hospital and walked into the emergency room on my own, not knowing I'd been shot. I was shot in midair when the Secret Service behind me, I thought it was firecrackers. And I had just finished saying, what the was that? When I was grabbed and thrown into the limousine, the door was open. And as it turns out, that's, I was shot on the way in, the bullet caromed off the side of the car, came through the gap between the door, the hinge gap between the door and the side of the car. And the reason is they showed me the bullet after they got it out and it was flattened out and covered with black <laughs> paint uh, from the car. But uh, I thought, because then he did what his Secret Service practice, he dived into the car on top of me to shield me. And it was then for the first time that I felt pain. I always assumed after all those movies where if you were shot, you grabbed yourself and looked agonized and fell down. I always thought that you felt it when it hit you. It didn't. It was after he landed on me. So I thought he'd done it. And I thought what had happened, the only thing I could reconcile with a paralyzing pain was that he must have broken mm -hmm. my ribs. And uh, I told him, get off, I think you've, and he did very quickly. We got up, by that time the door was closed and we were moving. And uh, he said, sit back. And I said, I can't, it hurts too much. By this time I had sat up and uh, suddenly I coughed and I had a handful of blood. Well, that's again, I still said, I, I must have broken and they punctured my lung. And by this time, he was saying George Washington Hospital. And uh, I used up my handkerchief, and then I used up his. <laughs> that continued coughing. I got a little scared because it seemed to me I was having, that I was getting less air every time I breathed in. But uh, it wasn't until they peeled me, because there was no great flow of blood or anything on the outside. And then it was explained because when they found it back here, it was just a narrow slit that flattened bullet had gone in edgewise and it hit a rib and then it tumbled down through the lung and stopped just short of the heart. But um, that, uh, it, afterward and with the time of recovery also, I, I feel self-conscious saying this. I, well, I had a feeling that whatever was left in time to me belonged to somebody else. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Jeff, you're a pits now, sir. I'll get a, I'll walk. Bill, why don't you wait a second? I'll okay. get him down in my office, all right? Oh. Yeah, well, 